<laughs> All right, very good. Well, we just read our verse and um, we're just gonna keep that to ourselves today, but I'll, I will light the candle. And um, as you can see, I still have, uh, you know, I usually buy at least three lilies, three Easter lilies. And this one here has been in my little workspace for, you know, since a, a week or so before Easter and it's still going. It's just, it smells so delicious. And uh, we always say our house is just the house of lilies during Easter time. And it's just interesting to see that the other two have pretty much waned, but this one is still going. So I wanted to bring it into our space today. And, um, you know, we are, we've entered the merry month of May. And um, so I really felt like it, it, it's such a powerful month. There's so many, uh, Nancy and I were talking before the call and, you know, how much has changed since we last met in April? Mm -hmm. Like the whole world has shifted. And, um, you know, I was doing that call for the, for the Sacramento folks last night. And, and it's such a different world there in California. They're, they're not really experiencing, I think, the fullness of the spring transition that we are. But this, this merry month of May, right? And, and of course, this May Day experience that the ancients called Beltane. So this is, you know, an interesting one. Uh, we celebrate that in the Waldorf schools, the May Fair, a lot of times. But it's named after this solar deity, Bel. And he's, he, he's the bright regen regenerator. He's called the protective shepherd. He's the fiercely shining one. So this idea of like really calling in the power of the sun, right? And, and it's, it's Beltane is a cross quarter. So we're here in this festival on the wheel of the year between the spring equinox, which seems like a hundred years ago, and we're moving toward the summer solstice. So I wanted to talk about it today because uh, I know we traditionally celebrate it on the eve uh, April 30th and then May 1st, but the actual astrological cross quarter is, is tomorrow, uh, May 6th. So this is when the sun hits 15 degrees of Taurus. And um, a lot of these, especially the cross quarters, were definitely movable feasts back in the day. They were really very much gauged by the changing condition of, you know, what's going on with the weather, what are the crops doing? You know, and back in, in, in um, the second cultural epoch, uh, the Sibylline Oracle would be the one to proclaim, okay, now we can do these festivals. Uh, and, and it was all about, you know, gaining the pr protection of Flora, the goddess of spring, you know, to, the pr protection for the tender, tender blossoms, right? So, this, this is another really, uh, I thought I would talk about some of the traditions. I just love to hear about, all, you know, the ancient ways and how we can sort of renew them in our lives and what are the symbols behind them. And one of the traditions uh, for this time of year would be to extinguish all the hearth fires. Now, this is a big deal because, you know, before we had central heat and all that good stuff, you know, keeping the hearth fires burning was a full-time job. You know, if the fires went out, then people got sick and died, you know, so, so it was important to always keep, you know, that, that hearth fire always kept burning. But there's this tradition where you have the faith that you will put out the hearth fire and then they kindle them again by creating a, com a big communal fire. They call it a need fire. And it was made up of the wood from the first nine trees from the Celtic tree calendar. So I don't know if you've ever looked into that, but there's a tree that's named for each one of the months. That's when it, it has its time to flower or, or, or fruit or whatever. And so it's the, the alder tree, which uh, has the qualities of shielding, of clearing and protection, and the ash tree. So I don't know if you have any ash trees around, but they, they're supposed to promote health and transformation. And the birch has a real uh, feminine energy quality and it represents new beginnings and renewal and change. And the hawthorn tree brings happiness and it's uh, sacred to the fairies. 
So you hear a lot of, in the fairy stories, the hawthorn tree and the hazel tree, which brings wisdom, dreams, prosperity, and holly brings good luck. And of course the oak tree, that strong tree has this masculine energy to it and, and uh, has the qualities of confidence or an abundant success. And uh, the rowan tree brings vitality. And the willow is all about um, intuition and can be used for divination. So these nine sacred trees, so they would kindle a fire from these and then the people would, would uh, jump over the flames, they jump over the smoke of the Beltane mm -hmm. fire and they would even uh, include their animals in this endeavor. So they would you know, drive the, the cattle around the, 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 uh, the, the need fire as a form of purification and fertility, prosperity, protection. And you know, when we were in uh, when we were in Santa Fe for the Sophia Rising Convergence, there were some wildfires happening then. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes the the sky would be sort of an orangey color, and you could you could smell the smoke. And for me, that was kind of disconcerting, and I was concerned. But a friend who lives, who's a local who lives there. She was like, oh no, no, this is, this is a cleansing. This is a purifying fire. So it helped to have that kind of a frame of reference that fire like water can be used as a form of cleansing. So uh, a good perspective I thought to have. And, um, can I just interject one little quick thing? When I was in, um, I've done a couple of pilgrimages to Europe along the Michael Mary lines, those, um, the meridians there, if they call them the naughty, not what do they call them? Ley lines, ley lines. Ley lines, right. But on the Beltane, they would light fires along all the naughties of the of that. And so like they could see they were on hilltops, right? And so they could see when one fire was lit, then the next would go. And so it would be like this string of pearls of these lights of these fires. And they were like actually the flames were actually affecting like like an acupuncture needle would go into the earth it'd be the flames were actually and so it was this entire energizing of the of the ley line that way and it was this they they thought of it as the virgin mary and her son michael you know that whole idea of mike Gael's, um connection with that sophia energy right through through mary and and how it it had the masculine, the perfected balance of the masculine feminine going along those ley lines. And so then it would be this, like if you could have seen it from, from a perspective above, it would you would have seen this whole necklace of fire on that night. And the people were doing the jumping and taking their cattle around and all of that. So oh, wow. Really amazing, really amazing to see. You got to be there when it was happening? I, I, no, no, I didn't get to be there on Beltane, but I was shown where the places were so I, I got to imagine it <laughs> you, can, well, you can picture it you know I mean that's the beautiful thing about this and that's I think part of this renewal is we can think about these acupuncture points on the earth and we can create our own sacred vortex wherever we are and and add to those those ley lines in the world mm -hmm. and with our intention we, we bring that kind of a focus you know, so thank you. That's that's a beautiful image. I, I would we should make a pilgrimage for, for that. That would be a fun thing to do. And it, yeah, well, you know, uh, this other aspect of of you know this idea of of purification or healing. You know, Steiner in when he was talking about the the lectures for the mystery schools, he really talks about how spring is ruled by this archangel Raphael right, the God of healing. We, we've talked about that before. But in terms of the, this, this archetypal cycle, so Beltane really marks the, the union of the polarities, right? So we have these male and female polarities. It's, it's this idea of bringing new life to the earth. So it's a traditional time for hand fastings. Have you heard that, that term before? So as a trans-denominational minister, I do a lot of these. Um, it's uh, it's a marriage for a year and a day, a hand fasting. So it's kind of a trial. It's like, okay, we're, we're going to move in together. Let's see how it goes. We're going to give it a year and a day, and then we'll see if we want to, you know, go further with with the marriage. So I think that's a kind of an interesting and um, 
makes sense to do something like that, to really take the time to, to consider, our, 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 am I compatible with this person? So this is a traditional time for that. And uh, of course, it's all about this, this idea of coupling, right? So, so people would make love outside to, to, to bless the crops and the earth. And um, yeah, and of course, there's the maypole, right? We have this, this maypole image of dancing around this maypole at Beltane. This, it's really a social art, right? It, it brings fertility, it brings this, this good fortune and that image of the, the, the ribbons um, wrapping around the pole by the dancers, it, it brings this, this sense of, of integration. So, you know, these kinds of, of dances, these community dances really, they raise energy. You know, this is a, a, a patterned way of raising energy. You know, it's a focused way of fulfilling not only a, a sacred function, but a, but a social one as well, right? Because people, you know, they're able to flirt, they're mingling, you know, after being kind of away for the winter, et cetera. So, um, yeah. And, and, and this tradition too of, of choosing the, the May Queen and the May King, mm -hmm. part of celebrating this May Day. So we have these, you know, this idea of the triple goddess, right? So you have this queen, but you also have the young girl dressed in white, representing the goddess in her maiden aspect. And, you know, the merry month of May and the word maiden actually both come from the same source. Hmm. So this word actually just basically means young. And, and some uh, English villages, the maiden is called Maid Marian, right? Or May Marian. And it's still considered to be Robin Hood's holiday. Mm -hmm. I don't know, when I was a kid, I, I really loved that whole thing about Robin Hood, you know, and his yeah. merry uh, band, etc. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I mean, this, this idea of like when people really lived where there were some forests around that, that people would go into the forest and they would find a, a flowering branch, particularly of the hawthorn tree, right? We, we, we mentioned that sacred to the, to the fairies. And then they would bring this flowering branch, you know, triumphantly into the village. And this is the tradition that we hear of, of bringing in the May. So that's where that comes from. It's really this sort of announcing, oh yeah, the, the trees are flowering. It's, it's the start of the planting season. And, and this, this volatile month of May, it's, it's really a time when, when the veils between the worlds can be easily pushed aside. So if you look at the wheel of the year, um, it's opposite Halloween and the cross quarter. So we know in Halloween, the, our beloved dead are able to, you know, kind of come into our world from, from the other side. And so he, we have here at Beltane, the opposite on the wheel of the year, the fairies can sort of enchant us into their mystical realms. Hmm. So you hear a lot of stories about people being spirited away and that they're in the, uh, the land of the fairies. They think it's a day, but it's really like a hundred years or something like that. So... Yeah, I, there was this, um, this music teacher, Jeff Spade, maybe you've heard of him. He, he was at the Waldorf School uh, in Chicago here. He's oh, over yeah. at the uh, New York School now. New York now. Yeah, but uh, he used to, during this time of year, he would always encourage the kids to wear their clothes inside out. He <laughs> said, if you wear your clothes inside out, that, ke that keeps the mischievous fairies from leading you astray. <laughs> <laughs> so we still kind of do that in our house, which is, which is kind of fun. And uh, yeah, you can see, I just, I just love this, this time of year. I remember when I was a kid that we, uh, the idea of, you know, watching what trees were flowering was like a big deal, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you, we would, um, in my mother's side of the family, people would give these little branches of trees and each one of the tree, tree flowers had a certain message. So it was like um, plum for the glum, you know, uh, elder for the surly, uh, pear blossoms for the popular, uh, thorn oh, blossoms for the prickly, you know, stuff like that. You know, so you, know, you could give a little message and it was kind of a humorous thing to do, you know. Uh, 
and and you know even today you know in, in Eastern Europe and the Ukraine um, you know there's this tradition of uh, usually the young men they go into the into the woods on on May Eve and they and they dig up a young flowering tree and they decorate it with ribbons and, and colored eggshells, right? A, a, a holdover from Easter. And then they plant it, you know, during the night, they plant it outside the bedroom window of their sweetheart. Mm -hmm. So this is still kind of a, a fun old tradition. And um, yeah, in Scandinavia and Germany, these, these May trees were uh, important both for people and for animals. So they would actually decorate these May trees and put them outside the barn door, you know, to sort of protect the newborn animals. So that was another another tradition. And um, on my father's side, you know, we have the Italians. And so uh, there's always this, this thing with lemons for the Italian yeah. folks. There's this thing with lemons. So they would they would tie the lemons and they put ribbons. Of course, there's always these ribbons around these these flowering branches. And um, my grandmother, I remember she would call the maypoles trees from the land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. And, um, but she would tell stories about when she was a, a, a young woman that the Italian maypoles, they, they were, you know, they would, they would put like prosciutto and uh, porta della cheese and they did like hang money from the top. <laughs> and then the men, and then they grease up the pole with lard. And then the men would have to like try to climb up it to, to get the prizes, you know. So, <laughs> you know, eventually the grease wears off and, and somebody gets the prize, you know. So, <laughs> but, uh, it, and then later when I was doing research, uh, long after she died, I found out that, that was, there was a custom similar in Wales. So it's interesting to see how these, um, you know, these traditions, they vary according to, uh, maybe it's not prosciutto, maybe it's, it's something else in Wales, but <laughs> it's just a great image. So yeah, uh, I, you know, many towns and villages and, and of course the Walder schools, they, they celebrate this, this Mayfair. And at our Walder school, we had um, a troop. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, Nancy Graham, do, do you remember Nancy Graham, Nancy? She had a no, couple of Let's see. Before. I probably remember her face, not her name, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, she was part of a, a, a mummer's troupe. They had like a, these Morris dancers. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was going to make a PowerPoint, but I, I didn't make the images. But they, um, they dress up in these costumes and they do these dramatic performances where they have like these exaggerated characters like... Um, Jack in the Green and the Fool. And um, so, yeah, this idea of the Fool was, was you know, the, you know, I know it's the, the May, you know, the April Fool, but there's still this imagery of the Fool's journey being understood in relation to spring because the number of the Fool is zero. Right? So it's the beginning of beginnings and this, you know, emergence out of the void of nothingness represented by Father Winter. So, so that was one of the characters. And then they would do these, these exaggerated leaping things as part of the dance. And this was a, supposed to be like a, a charm to show the crops how high they were supposed to grow. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's all this idea of like how the human being had to interact with the animal and the, the vegetable kingdoms, you know, that, that, that we were part of of instructing them, giving them encouragement to grow. And, um, and I remember particularly that they had this whole rhythmic thing that they did with these sticks where they would clash these sticks together and right. you know, represent this battle between the summer and the winter. And yeah, I mean, there were these other odd characters like the, the hobby horse, right? Um, and the, the hobby horse would have like a little a lump of coal and so he would he would run around and he would try to mark you know put like a little uh, streak of coal on the dresses of the the eligible maidens and if they if the if the maiden had a little mark of coal on them that that would qualify them to do the the maypole dance that they were eligible they were of age and you know ready to be uh partnered off so they so that was that was how they how they put that together 
yeah, so I just, I love all these. I could just go on and on, but there's um, a couple more uh, May Day customs that uh, that we actually do on the Zinnaker farm. You know, this idea of walking the circuit of, of one's property. Mm. So maybe you want to just go out and walk around your yard with this idea of, you know, bringing the periphery back to the center, you know, and feeling the center mm -hmm. moving out to the periphery. So those two boundaries. And of course, there's, you know, traditions of, of processions and archery tournaments and, and yeah, just this idea of making merry. Mm -hmm. But truly the, the farmers, uh, anyone who's really in touch with the cycles of the seasons and, you know, the elemental energies that are, that are rising up at this time, you know, we, we just feel this call to, to, you know, to celebrate, to, um, you know, to really feel the felicity, the fertility returning to the land. So many biodynamic farmers do a prepster on May Day. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you're gonna go out, but I'm gonna try to go, um, next, I think it's next week or the week after that the Zinnaker farm is gonna do the dandelion prep. Oh. So that's always a good, good thing. They're starting to come up now here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, time of celebration, exuberance, hope. We can really enjoy and appreciate these just starting uh, gifts of nature. And we have to really remember that, that, I mean, here in the Midwest, it's still a very precarious time. You know, the crops are still really young. They're very tender. They're susceptible still to frost. Um, we usually wait until Mother's Day to, you know, to really plant things outside, you know, and then still you never know what's going to happen. But yeah, and again, this, this idea of, of how can we bring back and renew the, what the ancients did, which was this thought that uh, the wheel of the year would not turn without human intervention. Hmm. So uh, we have to do our part to encourage the growth of the sun, to speak and communicate with these elemental beings, to encourage the nourishing and healing powers of rain. And, and of course, you know, besides this image of fire, we have water, you know, there's this, the special properties of water that are honored on May Day. And I love this, this mother goose rhyme that tells us, the fair maid who the first of May goes to the fields at break of day and washes in dew from the hawthorn tree will ever after handsome be. <laughs> so this tradition of, of, of the May dew, we can collect that anytime, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and then on the first Monday of May, it's a traditional time to, to go and decorate the well or, or to, to throw blossoms in, in bodies of water, you know, to bless this, this important uh, element. And, and those of us who strive to speak with the stars, we can, we can get up before dawn, the, the Pallades star clusters there, the seven sisters, right there before sunset on these May mornings, right in the constellation of Taurus uh, near, near his shoulder. So yeah, we can, we can stand on the earth and, and bring our prayers, our intentions for new growth into our actions. And we can also remember, yeah, we're rising in our thoughts to meet the cosmic forces which inspire our fertility. So even though it feels still a little bit chilly here, it's May Day's considered the start of summer. So this is the start of the time of milk and honey. You know, we can start to see the bees being active again and and yeah, this, this sensuous, fertile energy, it, it's, it's, it's totally universal. And, and it can be applied on, on so many levels. So for me, like as an anthroposophist, I really want to be able to acknowledge these creative forces in the dance of my life. You know, I really wanna take it on as, a, as, a, as my own personal, a uh, modern day version of dancing around the maypole, you know, where we just really, with our intentions, create this weaving, this, this combining, this, um, you know, right, this interweaving of, of opposing energies within ourselves. 
you know, uh, blending them into a balanced source. So I'm always looking for clues, right? We see it all, all out there in nature, but you know, sometimes there's a song or you know, a special flower in the garden that you start to see or a, a tree or the, you know, the way that the light is that reminds us that during these, these first days of May, that you are the queen of the May or the jack of the green. Because our bodies, like the body of the earth, instinctively knows that it's Beltang, right? You feel it, don't you? It's like we just feel that this is a time of vitality and passion and new growth. And, and the wisdom of our spirit really seeks the, the natural union of the polarities that, that occur at this time, really giving us a, a, an opportunity for, for integration in the alchemical dance of our souls. So yeah, because you know, under all the, the sexual innuendo, it's really about you know, what, we, what we did at the, at the Sophia conference. It's about this inner mystic marriage, this symbolic union of fire and water. These opposites combining and complementing each other to become one, bringing all the elements into balance. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can just, you can go dancing naked in the forest preserve on your own time. But for now, <laughs> let's just, you know, do the work to, to unify the polarities of our being and, you know, let it spark this, this new fire of creativity by marrying it with the, the beautiful healing waters of, of compassion and, and pure love so that we can truly celebrate the, the marriage feast of our lives with a, a grounded, mindful joy. So, you know, for me, I, I always like to, you know, those little candles that float. Do you ever work with those? So I like to do that where, you know, like at this time of year, I'll, you know, create my own little bell fire, you know, you know, light those floating candles and marry it to the water. And, you know, you can find a little chalice of your choice and, you know, just, just, just this idea of doing that and taking the time to just be there and maybe whisper, you know, uh, your marriage vows into the water, you know, you can, uh, you know, do, do whatever your intention uh, setting is for, for a ceremony of your own, you know, short, simple, silent, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's about really what's inside. And, and then it's about, you know, what you're going to do with what's inside out into the world. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I went on and on here because it's just, it's one of my favorite times of year. And thank you. I am all ears, Hazel. That was lovely. Thank right. you. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. I think it makes so much sense because I, I, I think you're talking about marrying what's in our DNA, like what we know from past lives too, and into what, you know, what we're living now. And that's why I, I just love how much you know, and I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, we can, we can, you know, call those things up in ourselves. I do feel like we have an ancestral memory that, that wants to be called up and honored, you know, and, and renewed. So um, I feel like if we if we if we leave all those things behind, we're we're missing this opportunity to interact, you know, with right. not only our past selves, but with our future selves, you know, and with the the you know the beings of of the earth. So yeah, and the stars. <laughs> so <laughs> good. So you did you go out and get some dandelions? I did. I did. I found a couple. I thought oh. we could make uh well, I, there's so many ways to make flower crowns and to crown ourselves with flowers. This time of year is just in line with everything Hazel's been describing. Um, and at first I thought, well, I'm not gonna ask people to get up and go get flowers. Uh, so I thought, oh, we'll just like cut some out of paper. And so I, <laughs> if you wanna join me in this, I'll work with paper, but I'll also show you with real flowers. But you can work with paper. I'm going to show you the simplest, most wonderful flower crown construction. Um, it's it's just one trick, and so you don't need too many of these. But at least take one sheet and fold it so you have long way. The you want the longest 
length you can get out of it in half and then in half again. And these are not exact folds because we're gonna be cutting our paper flower out of it. I got a scissors. Yeah, you'll need scissors. Um, I'll just show you since we're adults and not children, I'll show you where we're headed. With children, I usually do this, let them get there as a surprise. Um, but I made this last night and I didn't make really exciting flowers, but this is just a little simple paper flower crown. It's about the right size for a baby or a doll. <laughs> um, and this was two sheets of paper. So um, yeah, just fold it long ways, long ways again. And then just start cutting. I used, I started at the bottom, cut a stem. So you, and then somewhere, and at the top we want a flower. So the first thing I did was make just balls, but those aren't that interesting. So, but the simplest thing you could do is just make a little ball and then come back down with a stem. So you just, uh -oh. it's, the, it's the gesture of a, of a stem and a flower. Yeah. So just a little ball at the top and you can fringe it if you want. And they should be all separate. Don't worry about making them connected. They'll each, this, they'll completely be individuals. Yeah. You can fringe it, take a moment. And this will be plenty to work with. Um, I did it another time. I made a more of a flange kind of a thing. Oh, I've lost you. We've lost you here. Linda, Linda, you're frozen. Oh, well. Probably just as well. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm going to be unfrozen. I always, I always uh, manage to uh, cut. Okay. Well, they're they're all separate, you are. Anyway, Linda. They're all they are they're not connected. Yeah, they're not connected. Cut them apart. Oh, that's they're all, good. Oh yeah, this is not a connection one. <laughs> the, the the gesture we're going to do is to weave them together. So we have nature which appears separate to us, and we're going to weave it together. As Hazel was telling us, it's our job to do some of this work. So all you need is two to start with. Um, and you should get at least four out of that first fold. Yeah, See, I knew it. <laughs> Fine. Use what you got. That's I'll okay. use what I got. Use what you got. Absolutely. <laughs> and I went out. I went out, and from my front yard, I managed to pull a couple of little dandelions and things. Just what I had. Nothing special. When you make, when we make crowns at the school for Mayfairs, I mean, we go out and we get boxes of beautiful florists, long stem flowers, but you don't need them. You can do it with this. So one flower here, starting to build. This is the basic gesture. Just put, put this, put them like that. And then this dangling, the, the add-on, the new flower, either way, front or back, doesn't matter. I'm doing it like that so you can see. The dangling one now reaches up and goes between. It wraps just up and between. You can work towards yourself or away from yourself, whichever. I'm working towards you because I actually find it easier. And then you have a little wrappy, a little cross there. Oh, it doesn't matter which way it goes. But the gesture then would be to gather the stems here. Yeah, and you're gonna start building. So the next flower goes there. I'm gonna do them quite far apart so you can really see. So the next flower is added there. And you're gonna wrap again, the dangling stem down, wrap it between, round just between the last flower and the new one and gather the stems. So now we have three stems. Yeah, and I have a fourth from my 
cutting. So again, set, add your flower. I find it very useful to make this sort of horizontal crown with the new flower add-on as a vertical because it really helps you make that wrap. So on the one side, it looks like this. And on the other side, it looks like that. Yeah, there you go. So I'm going to leave you to doing that yourself. But if you want to see what it looks like with actual flowers, it really helps to get long ones. So here's my beginning. I always start with the longest stem I can get just for uh, a base. There's the first add-on. And this flower wraps over. Mm -hmm. The stem goes over and under. See how that nice. goes? over and under and i'm not again i'm not doing this too close <laughs> a little front yard flower over between the two and to the side gather it together this is a great thing to do with children oh yeah they love it. I have a sort of an interesting memory. We used to go picnicking. I'm from rural Virginia near Manassas Battlefield, which I think in the North you call Blue uh, Bull Run. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to always go to the battlefield for our picnics. So we would always have a picnic right around this time of year. And all the girls, we would all be sitting here making flower crowns. And all the boys would be running around on the hills, you know, pretending to be. I mean, they knew the they knew their battalions even. I mean, that was scary. They were all reenactors. <laughs> so, um, you know, and the, and we'd we'd be going. Oh, there's a ghost. Oh, there's a ghost. <laughs> we were so communing with the ghosts of the murdered. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty intense. So, um, <laughs> the worlds are close together in the spring. So yeah. So then it just builds. And you can make them as dense as you want or as close together as you want. And there's, nice. now to join them, it's a little fiddly with real flowers, but you just push the edges together and wind, maybe wind another one around. Feel free to use a little bit of wire. Florist wire is the best. It works great. String works great. But even more beautiful is to take a, about a yard, I mean, a good yard of ribbon or more and after you've got your flowers built, or maybe while you're doing it, it helps secure them. Take a good section of ribbon, maybe that's enough to tie in back. So what would that be about 15 inches, 20 inches, maybe even. Mm -hmm. And then start wrapping, make a little knot at the end of your crown here, like at the first or the second flower. So it's strong. And then wrap just the same way in between each flower, the same mm -hmm. way you wrapped each flower. And that will help secure the flower stem wrapping and then you have um a crown that is not a round but a length and you can just tie the ribbons together that is a very secure crown that'll last all day and if you really want to make it last even more than a couple of hours of maypole dancing you can uh, put florist wire in there too um usually we make the crown and wrap the wire pretty much at the same time. And then the ribbon goes on at the very end. Um, and, and different things last. Like I picked these little forget-me-nots. I wasn't sure whether they would last. Mm. But I think, you know, and then I've never made it out of violets, but oh my gosh, I, that was the first thing I found today. And so here was this little, mm -hmm. these little violets, a little wee crown for a baby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And you know, of course, the other Mother's Day, the American thing, if you're into sugar, um, you take uh, egg white and you whip it up and you paint with just a little cheap watercolor brush, or you can dip a violet into the egg white and then you dip it into powdered or sugar that's been like bar sugar that's been really finely ground. So I just throw sugar in the blender, grind it really fine so it's dusty. And um, if you wanna be really 
interesting about it. You put a tea drop of blue food coloring in there and the blue over the violet of the violet flowers in the sugar is just phenomenal. And then you let it dry and you put it on a window screen or a plate. And if it's a dry, airy day, it's, it, it dries pretty quickly. And then you have something that will keep a couple of weeks and you can certainly put it on your May Day, decorate your May Day things with yummy little candied violets. <laughs> That's another fun thing to do with children because even a three-year-old can can do this yeah. if they don't eat too many. <laughs> adorable. So there, there we have a a little May activity. Thank uh, you. Thank yeah, you. boy, it's so funny that um, I was like so gung ho about like oh we've got four more chrysalis group things and I, I was like. Oh, we, we could do we could do mother the origins of Mother's Day. Oh, but we got to talk about the Buddha Moon, and we got to talk about <laughs> the eclipses. And oh, don't forget, you know, there's Ascension and Whitson coming up. And you know, I mean, there's I mean, that's the thing about you know, if you only do part of the year, you don't get to do all the festivals. You know, <laughs> so um, yeah, boy. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was really it was really thank nice you. to share. This is lovely. And you know, it's so it's so lovely to think of it in terms too of this is that lead up to ascension, this 40 day conversation time with, you know, with with the Christ speaking so um frankly, if you will, right, to the apostles. And so so all of this is like it's kind of an interesting symbol for how well we are we are receiving at a different level. You know, like like you're saying, Hazel, is like is be be that human force right and so i i think i see it weaving nancy right i see it weaving into that and so mm -hmm. it's so beautiful i love this thank you so much i always send these to my granddaughter oh <laughs> great i was getting all these little pieces that i make yeah yeah so it's oh, fun that's great yeah i'm just beginning to have grandchildren now too and they're pretty small still but three and seven months and another oh. one coming soon mm -hmm. and it's pretty delightful i gotta say yeah, I do, it with yeah. I do it with my great nieces. I actually over Christmas did the one where you had the little ball. Oh, on the, the ball and cup. Yeah. Oh my goodness. See, and that was a simple one. I could do that. And so I had success. And so I showed it to them and it was just lovely. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, I've got the other ones that I messed up a little bit, but I can go back and look and I can get those. Exactly. And then I can share those too. So it was wonderful to be able to do that. It's such a gift. Thank you. Thank, thank you for bringing that, going back and looking, bringing that up because I want before next Wednesday, I'm going to try to get each of them on the Padlet as a separate little instruction. And I realize with my hands in front kind of going this way and that it's a little hard to follow and it's fast and we're only doing it in real time. But if you had it as a series of set images yeah. on the padlet you could right. always go back to it take your time and look at it so i, I did put the make crown up already this morning oh good uh, oh, so that's great. there for Thank you, you. <laughs> <laughs> but i'm gonna go back in the next week. Out. yeah we can have those a little resource this is wonderful yeah well, and that ball and cup that is <laughs> a, the best rainy day backup for is yes. ever <laughs> Mm -hmm. ever ever um i mean depending on how old you have the children the first graders can do it and you give them a little short string you cut it for them but i've had high schoolers cut six foot strings <laughs> and challenge themselves and they can do it <laughs> wow <laughs> Fun. perfect Come yeah on. yay <laughs> presents <laughs> it's good all right. Well, maybe I'll just read the calendar of the soul to to us out for our day. And uh, thank you so much. This was really, really just so sweet to be together. Yeah. Thank you. And, and so, we, yes, Tareen. Hazel, have we decided we're going to keep this doing this, or are we just going to let this be our finale? Well, maybe we'll maybe we'll let this be our finale, and we'll yeah. we'll uh, put some energy into we're going to you know do the the cohort uh, on next Wednesday. So we'll we'll think about what we want to, how, how much we want to cram into those 20 minutes, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, this is a great way to go out actually. I think. Yeah. 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 A big Mayfair. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I, I I agree. You know, living into these these forty days, and then of course the fifty days. It's it's such a special time, and I'm I, I you know, it really is the Easter tide. It doesn't go away. At, you know, at Easter, you know, we have that amazing Holy Week, and then the the mysteries are really starting to to come forth, and this is the time for us to digest them and really take them in, and then. You know, how do we bring that connection with the ascension for, for, you know, what we've learned on earth? How do we take that up to the heavens, right? And then, of course, then that's what rains down on us in the tongues of fire from, from the Holy Spirit, from that Sophia, come, that wisdom comes back. And then that gives us our, our uh, you know, our right livelihood in the world. And we take that out. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's so amazing. And then, of course, you know, there's... There's uh, St. John's then too in, in June, and then we we start the whole process again with Nicholas. So um, yeah, at least we got to mention them, and then we can yeah. all go out there and explore them. So good. Great. Thank you. All right, the third week of the calendar of the soul. Thus to the all world speaks in self-forgetfulness and mindful of its primal state the growing human eye. In you, if I can free myself from fetters of my selfhood, I phantom my essential being. Hmm. All right, essential ones, blessings. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. you. It was Thank wonderful. You. Yeah. It was lovely. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.